You're listening to the Purpose Chasers podcast, designed to provide heart-centered hustlers with rock-solid strategies and resources to help you step out from behind your business and create sustainable wealth. Systematize, optimize, scale, and relax. More revenue, less hustle. Let's get into this episode. Taylor, I am very, very excited to have you on Heart Centered Hustlers. You're a, f- I just got to be straight, man. You're a fucking face that I literally see everywhere on the internet. I mean, you're in, and not even in a bad way because, and I have to share this real time experience. One of, one of the team members in our marketing company, and we run uh, lead gen for solar companies and HVAC companies, he actually got caught in uh, whatever whatever retargeting campaigns you guys had set up and he got a $47 copywriting course. And he called me yesterday. He's like, did you interview Taylor yet? And I'm like, no. And he's like, dude, tell him I'm impressed. And I was like, I go, why? What's up? He's like, I got a Facebook message and literally two phone calls. And like, he's, I was like, well, how, how were his, how were his sales reps? Cause I know you're also doing sales training and what is it? The sales mentor? What are you calling it? That yeah, program sales mentor. Yep. And I was like, well, how, how were they on the, how were they on the call? Cause I love sales and the psychology of selling. And he, and he goes, bro, they were savages. He goes, they were savages. And he goes, and they weren't doing it in a dishonest, like it wasn't any pushy. He's like, they were just asking the right questions to lead me to obviously whatever their high ticket offer was, man, really, really grateful to have you on. I have a couple directions that I plan to go with you and we'll just see what unfolds. Thank you so much for taking time. Dude, thanks for having me. It'll be fun. My first question for you is, and and that's what, as soon as you popped on the Zoom, it's the immediate thing that I asked. So being being an individual that is working on scaling a marketing company out, we're actually in the process of, I interviewed three potential media buyers yesterday, right? That seems to be, we had to turn our own lead gen off because we couldn't, we were dropping the ball on clients on the back end and you can't do that if you want to build a reputation and grow. So we had to hit pause. Yeah. How the hell do you have the time? You told me that you have only been in traffic and funnels, your company, 10 hours the last month. How the hell did that happen? How long did it take? And what was the process of making that happen? Because I don't want the audience members to think that like you built, you know what I mean? All of a sudden you just scaled yourself out of a company because I've been watching you. I've been watching you put in work for a few years now. Yeah. I mean... And, and that, that doesn't mean that I've only worked 10 hours you know, in the last month because we have WealthCap, we have Sales Mentor, we have an acquisition deal overseas. We have a couple other things that I'm putting time into. But man, it was the first challenge for us was just figuring out how to hire people to do work for us. Like, we, you, know, you know how it is. Like, when we started TF, me and Chris are doing everything. Chris was running ads, uh, he was writing copy, he was paying for the media, I was doing sales, and then we had the fulfillment. And we just went through this dance of we would scale and then we would break everything. Everything would break. And then we would have to rebuild it, hire some people to help us do the work. We would scale again and everything would break. And we did that for a steady three years, you know, three, three and a half years. And we went through several teams as well. I think it took us a long time to master the ability to not only work through other people, but to think through other people. And that's level two. And I always tell people there's two different levels of delegation. The first is you delegate work, right? I'm going to pay you for your hands. I'm going to pay you for your physical labor. But level two is you outsource the decisions. I'm going to pay. I'm not going to just pay you for your hands. I'm going to pay you for your brain. I'm going to let you make decisions. And when an entrepreneur gets to that second level, all of the caps go away. You know, there's no, there's no more need for the founder to be the one making all the decisions. And so we, we really pivoted from, you know, 2017, 2018, we just trying to find a team and we can't lead them the right way. And so we have to end up letting people go because a bad leader will cripple even a good team. And we went through a couple of iterations and then 2018 to 2019 was really learning how to trust people to make mistakes and teach them how to think. And then something really clicked at the end of Q1 in 2019 to where when a team member would come to us with a problem, rather than saying, here's what I would do, go fix it. 
It was like, well, what do you think we should do? And that was a pivotal moment because all of a sudden, now you get to really leverage the thinking skills of the people on your team. Not every idea has to be your idea. Not every solution has to be your solution. And so now that's, that's how we've gotten to where we are with TF today is if there's a problem, more than likely somebody on the executive team is going to be fixing it before it even gets to us. We've transitioned from really the doers in the business. So we're just kind of advisors. We're consulting our team on how they can become better thinkers and producers. And uh, that makes scale easy. You, you, I mean, you say it so nonchalantly, right? And, and I, I, you know, as an entrepreneur, as somebody that's in, you know, stage one in, in the marketing company that we created, right? Of like hiring team, don't know how to empower them. The ego is still engaged. Oh, this is, we built this, right? So yeah. what, what was the, I mean, what was the, you know, banging your head off the wall moment that you were like, okay, well, what do you think we should do? I mean, dude, depends on how deep you want to go into that. I think, I think the whole year of 2017 and probably 10 months of 2018 was just brutal to the point where I think one of the linchpins for us was we just got burned out and we were like, we don't care. We don't care about scaling anymore if this is what it takes to scale. And I wish I would have learned that lesson differently. If I was being a proper marketer right now, I would have this nice polished story around it. But the truth is, is I just was I just didn't know. And we got to the place of burnout where we didn't care anymore. And we had big goals, but we were like, those goals don't seem very good anymore because of what it's costing us just to maintain. We were stuck at 350, 450 a month in revenue. And we're like, if this is how hard this is, I can't imagine what it would take to get to a million. And we're just like, whatever, we don't really care. And what we noticed in that season was that we were kind of smothering our team, actually. We were, we were, it, nobody will rise if there's not a space for them to rise. And so when we kind of got out of the way a little bit, uh, the business group, and we were like, what, how did that happen? You know, like we, we got tired of it and kind of stepped back and then it grew. If you're paying attention, you'll learn in those moments because it wasn't until we actually stopped telling everyone what to do that they started figuring out what to do themselves. So it was more of a burnout thing. And I think we just got lucky and we saw what the team could do and we no longer were interested in micromanaging that team. Does that make sense? It ma makes perfect sense to me. I hope it makes sense to the audience. And I, I had a place after, so we had, you know, we had launched a new offer to the solar industry. It was insane. Hundred, you know, we had a hundred leads come through, hundred plus, sixty-two calls booked. We're, I mean, we're closing. You know, we're good at closing. Like that's not our problem. The problem was onboard onboard processes weren't dialed in, in the back end. You know, we were putting all the work on one media buyer and we absolutely broke like right before COVID-19 and then COVID-19, no one can do in-home sales. So it all crashed. And so we decided to, you know, drop a new offer, relaunch, really not, you know, not focus as much on grinding because I, I remember right before COVID-19, like my wife was like, not, she wasn't that pumped, dude. Right. Like it was like, what, like, what do you, like, I don't know you, like, yeah. where are you? Like, what do you mean? I got to yeah. go work. She's like, I know it's Sunday and it's eight o'clock at night. Like you've been working like you, when do you stop? And I was like, well, I go to bed. I'm doing this for us. She's like, ah. And then I started to like this, you know, you know, when the, you've heard the quote a million times, but it finally hits you. And I was like, I don't want to come home with a wallet full of money to a house full of strangers. Right. That quote just hit me. And I'm like, yeah. and then I really started to think like, what in the hell am I working for? Like, what, what am I saving for? What am I building for? That was my moment. Have you ever ran into any of those? You married? Yeah. Yeah, I, I am. We have one baby girl. She's one year and two months old. And, you know, I, I definitely hit that moment. We actually talk about this in a couple of our promotions for one of our products called the Productivity Pack. I was just working around the clock, similar to you. And my moment like that was when she said on a date night, she's like, I don't want to have a baby if I'm going to be raising the baby by myself. And I was Ooh. like, yikes, yikes. Uh, this is not okay. You know, I got to figure out a way to increase our level of living while being at home and being present, or I have to let go of the increase that I've wanted. I've got to let those goals go. And out of that place of necessity, here's what happens, man. When, you, when you're put into that position, a lot of times your greatest 
innovations, your greatest changes, your greatest evolutions, they come from that place of necessity. So we even teach in our sales training all the time. And necessity is king. If you feel like you have to figure something out, more than likely you'll figure it out. And the problem is people live lives of comfort and ease. They're never put into a place where they're between a rock and a hard spot. They never have any challenges. They're weak. They're weak people. They're weak thinkers. You know, they may be hard workers with their hands, but they don't work hard with their minds. And those moments where you feel like, like what you just described, you know, those are the most, those have been the most pivotal moments for me because they've trained me. And we have a theory on this. We can talk about later called theory of constraints, but they've trained me to really dig deeper into figuring out problems and solutions with my mind. And what most entrepreneurs want to do is just want to work harder. It's never the secret. You're not going to get to 50 million a year working harder. It's not possible. Let's get right into your theory. And I got to, I got to, I got to share this. I mean, I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of your videos, probably through retargeting because I watch your videos, right? <laughs> like, yeah. uh, so it's probably through retargeting, but the one thing that always stands out to me, especially in the, in the realm of marketing and funnels and, you know, the way that you came up, like there's a million people out there talking, right? But every, there's a, there's a piece of you that's always intrigued me in the pieces that you're an intellectual. Like I know that you could script a video, right? And, and record the video. And, but I can see your brain going, right? So I just wanted to acknowledge you, man. You're an intellectual, which is a piece of you that I want to dive into on the, on this interview. I want to know what you're up to, what your practices are and all that. But let's get into your yeah. theory before we pass it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And thank you for that. But th- this is the idea of, you know, when you, we, I grew up playing baseball and when you're on deck, you put that weight on the end of the bat and you swing. And when you take the weight off, it's easier to swing faster with more power. Man, when we were when we got into this this mode in TF, where it's like we want to shift gears so that we can have more speed with less RPMs. We want to figure this out. One of the things we stumbled upon was this idea of manufactured resistance. Manufactured resistance. Same same thing when you see somebody in the gym. You go into the gym and you see somebody lifting. You know they're bench pressing two hundred pounds, two hundred and eighty pounds, three hundred and thirty pounds. This is manufactured resistance. They put the weight on the bar and they push. And the resistance that that does is it makes the tensile strength stronger, right? You can do the same thing with your brain. And I just actually got done. It's funny. I just got done training some, some, not all of them, but some of our salespeople on this idea. If you can become a person that is really good at at self-manufactured resistance, then the resistance, the real resistance in life is not going to be a big deal for you. And here's what I mean by that. Let's say that, you know, you're selling whatever, uh, solar roof or whatever, and right now, you know, you look at the last 30 days and your average salesperson sells three per month and they work 40 hours a week. The theory of constraints would say, sit down in the morning, grab a notebook and think about this question. How do I double my sales and cut my working hours in half? So there's a target and there's a constraint. The constraint is cutting the working hours in half. The target is doubling your output. When you do this, you should make sure that this manufactured resistance seems impossible. Okay. Okay. Here's another example with wealth cap. How do I buy 150 houses a year and all of them are free? That seems impossible. The target is 150 houses. The constraint is all of them are free. You get good at putting yourself into this position where you are racking the weight on the bar. You're putting the weight at the end of the baseball bat and you think through it and you become sharp. You become strong. You become quick, agile, mobile, adaptable. You get all of these things built into your central nervous system and into your neurology And then when you go into the actual game, okay, when you go into actual selling, you've already dealt with this manufactured resistance. You've already dealt with it. You've already written down the ideas. And what life is going to throw at you is a whole lot easier. If you do it right, it's a whole lot easier than what you've already dealt with in the notebook at the beginning of the day. You do this in every area of your life. The people who do this, they just cut through resistance like a knife through butter because mentally they're so freaking sharp. They've already thought through all of the worst case scenarios that they have solutions to things before they even pop up. Make sense? Totally. And if we had a sales rep that was working 40 hours a week and, and making three sales, he, d- he doesn't go here anymore. Okay. <laughs> I just, uh, not my, not my industry. So I'm like, I don't yeah. know how much sales, yeah. how many sales you do. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh we have, we have a killer right now, but the, but the struggle is, right, and I'm an intellectual. I'm a deep thinker. I have a lot of whiteboards. I do a lot of quiet time. I do a lot of reflecting. 
and, and all of that, which uh, some of the stuff that I want to get in with you and find out what your practices are. And, you know, my biggest resistance or what constraint, if you will, is the not believing that I can, you know, transfer what I do or empower somebody else to, to duplicate. Right. And I think that the four partners that are in our, in our agency right now, we're all really good in our silos. Yeah. Now, now it's the struggle of like, how do we release the reins? How do we, I guess I'll ask you this question. Can you think of the first time you empowered one of your staff to make a decision and they royally fucked something up? Yep. Yeah. But that's not necessarily the problem. The problem is oftentimes a leader will penalize somebody for making the wrong decision. When that leader, how did we learn? We had to learn by making wrong decisions. Mm -hmm. There were, there are things in our businesses that we regret and we got the opportunity because we own everything. We got the opportunity to learn from that mistake. And I see a lot of leaders not give their team members the opportunity to learn from their mistakes. You know, somebody who works for me, if they make a mistake and they know they made a mistake, they're going to enforce their own penalty on them. Like they're going to be mad, angry. If they're not angry, they're the wrong team team member. Like they're going to get replaced. But I can think back absolutely to multiple times at the beginning of TF where somebody did the wrong thing. And I came in and just was like very heavily reprimanded corrective. And I ended up kind of teaching them that they weren't allowed to make mistakes. And that, that was the wrong lesson. And I tell people today, you know, I trust you enough to make the wrong decision, but don't make that same wrong decision over and over. That's not how it works here. You, know, you want to learn from your mistakes. And so because of that, people on the team have an opportunity to learn the same way that I learned. And therefore they become capable as I am capable. That's how you replace yourself. It's gold. How long have you been at this? When did you, were you working a job at one point and launched yeah. out into entrepreneurship? Yeah, dude. I, uh, I actually, my first career job was at a church in Memphis, Tennessee. And I did that for about two years. And then I transitioned into a real estate firm in Memphis, Tennessee. And I did that from 2013, the end of 2013 to the beginning of 2015. So I picked up my first book. I just learned marketing randomly because my wife wanted more clientele. She's a hairstylist. I was like, you know, I can, I can learn marketing. I didn't go to school for it. I didn't know what I was doing, but I read a book and I tried it and it worked. And then I just fell down the rabbit hole. I'm definitely someone who tries to learn through doing. And so I think that that served me well. So yeah, I was working at a job. I replaced my income, quit the job and never looked back. You launched a marketing company or what was it that you launched out into? I just was doing freelance copywriting. So I was writing sales letters and sales funnels. And uh, I was using Infusionsoft before Infusionsoft was cool, back bef- back when it was still cool, before ClickFunnels, just taking clients and writing copy for them and making them sales. It wasn't until the later, like I think Q4 of 2015 that me and Chris partnered up on Traffic and Funnels. And so Traffic and Funnels is technically four and a half years old, almost five. We'll be five years old in September. Where are you at right now with Traffic and Funnels? Like, and I can, I can visualize, and I'm not talking like front, you can share whatever you're comfortable sharing or not comfortable with sharing. I'm just seeing what you're doing, right? Like I watched you drop Sales Mentor and now I'm seeing other things. Like I said, my team member, just he stated he bought a $47 copywriting. I think it was a course that I think your partner dropped. He's like, dude, it's absolutely fire. And I was like, well, stand by because they're they're about to hit you. And he was like, well, what do you mean? And then he hit me up two hours later and he's like, dude, I just got a Facebook message and two phone calls. I'm like, yeah, dude, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So where are you guys at five years into this journey? TF is around a million and a half a month. Um, sales mentors trending right now to we'll be at a million a month, probably by next month, probably trending this month around eight fifty. And then wealth cap is about a year old, a year. And so TF is almost five years old. Sales mentor is almost two years old. Wealth cap is about a year old and we will probably end the year buying about 30 houses a month with wealth cap. The wealth cap is just a different game. It's different economics. Everything is, you know, our lowest tiered price point on, on wealth cap is hundred grand. So that business will scale faster, but it's also a little bit less profitable. So collectively, man, we'll probably end 2020 at a run rate around 38 
35 to 38 and hopefully double next year 2021 you, dude, your mind's already there, bro. Like you're, yeah, it is. You're one. I mean, you're one of the sharpest minds I've I've been able to converse with in a podcast setting. What's the goal? Like, what what is it that you're that you're working for? What are you out to achieve with all of this? Well, it changes. I think it's changed multiple times for us. You know, at first it was just we wanted to make money, and, uh, and that, then we made that, so much that wasn't sustainable for long. No, it, it wasn't. In fact, it was counterproductive because yeah. you know we we were making this we were making amount of amounts of money that made us terrified of losing the money, and so then we had to. I think I think it's just all about learning how to play the game at new levels, and it's not linear. Like people want to think that you know you have one goal, then you chase it and you achieve it, and then you set another goal. And I don't think that that's necessarily how it works at the highest levels of, of, of the sport. Part of the goal to chase should be just playing the game well. And if there are areas in your business or your life that you're not playing well, do you have the self-awareness, which it sounds like somebody you do, like you does, like you're, you have a lot of quiet time. You probably have the self-awareness. You probably know exactly in your life where you're coming up short. And you likely are the type of person that enjoys fixing that. That is sustenance all by itself. No money attached to it. It's just the fulfillment of putting one foot in front of the other and stepping forward. But to answer the larger question, you know, man, for us, like, obviously, man, me and Chris are still like, we, our faith is still important to us. We still are passionate about that. We love the element. This sounds cheesy, but we love like giving for us, like giving financially. I just paid for somebody's food who got laid off by COVID-19 and Man, there, there's something to that. Like, there's something to not being a piece of shit with your money and not being a loser. And it's like, I see these people where it's like, you know, they, the only thing they do with their money is they buy stuff. And I'm like, man, you're just missing the game. There's no missional element to what you're doing. And we wanna, we wanna own, like, at this point, we wanna own the entire verticals in which we play. So that's another game. That'll take us three years. Like, that'll keep us busy for at least three years, you know? <laughs> And we'll have to invest something else. Yeah, bro, we'll that's so aggressive. I I really like you. That'll take so us look, three we got, years. We've got we've got Charlotte, <laughs> we've got Kansas City, we've got Birmingham, Alabama, Knoxville, Tennessee. Like we're buying these houses, but if you look at the if you look at take a whiteboard, it's like what what are all the ways that we have to pay money? And there's you know when we acquire a business, we're either acquiring it because it's going to make us more money, it's going to make us revenue, or it's going to decrease expenses in another company. So a penny saved is a penny earns in a lot of cases. It's like, how do we, how do we own the, the, a plumbing company in each of these cities? How do we own uh, a lawn care company in each of these cities? And you just verticalize the entire thing. You can do the same thing in traffic and funnels. You can do the same thing in sales mentor. What are all of the expenses that are hitting our bottom line? We're going to go after that business. We're going to build something or buy something that is going to transfer services to another business and decrease, really decrease the expenses, increase the margins. And then you wake up one day and you're just playing the game. And all of a sudden you have, you know, $60 million in annual run rate and your expense ratio to that $60 million has been completely wiped out by the services or the profits of other companies. And you have the ability to feasibly run $50, $60 million at a 90% profit margin. People think it's impossible, but it's just the verticalization of that market. Now, maybe... I'm kind of going off a deep end there, but guess what inspires me? That inspires me. You know, I want to own everything and I want to really work everything together so that there's a flywheel here. And when there's a flywheel and when the team's trusted, you wake up one day and you don't have to do anything and your money is still coming in. I can see that you have a servant's heart. I, I could see that before. I mean, maybe not necessarily in watching, you know, the content that you put out, but like just being on this call with you, like you're, for as successful as you've become in the last, you know, four or five years, you're still pretty down to earth. You're not like, you know, flicking your Rolex in the video. You know what I mean? Like you're just not, I've been on, I've been on calls with some tools, right? Yeah. Just some people yeah. that are like, bro, are you come back down. Like we're here. Like you could lose all that. And then what do you have? All you have is the relationships that you've built. And so one of the things that I do in my business is every year I like this last year, my wife and I adopted seven families for Christmas because Amazing. I, 
Yeah, one of my like well, my heart project is getting to living in a world where no child experiences a lack of Christmas, right? Christmas is a time of yeah. celebration and obviously with your faith, which we won't rabbit hole into too much, like it's a much more meaningful season than just like what did I get for Christmas, right? It's it, in my family it's always been a celebration and you know, so this last year we adopted seven kids and I started asking myself, okay, if I put this much money in out of my business, what, like, what is the math that I need to make to put that into 70 kids? Right. And so people think that I'm just like, you know, out here grinding, chasing dollars. They don't understand that I'm doing this behind service. Like I'm not viewing dollars. Like guys like us, we make money. You take everything away from us, like we're gonna have some bucks tomorrow, right? Like it's just it's just gonna happen. But you get me behind a service project like that, and I get super fired up. Do you have any in your real estate investing, your business investing? I heard you you know you just bought you know somebody who is experiencing what a lot of people are going to experience with COVID nineteen that maybe even haven't yet. Like, have you thought about a service project? Is there one? Is it under the curtain and you can't talk about it? Or what Like, what fires you up? Yeah, dude. I mean, there's a lot of those things. We actually teach our salespeople to do the same thing. And so if you come into one of our sales meetings, probably every couple of weeks, somebody's asking, who can I get money to? Because it's a principle. It's not even a spiritual principle. It's just a principle. It's just a, it's just a, it's math. You know, when you have a, a greater purpose, that is bigger than just collection, you're able to do more with more energy. But we give a lot of money to our churches. Uh, Chris has several organizations that he donates money to. You know, We have a partnership lined up that's kind of in the works. It's gotten a little bit of traction, but not, not as much as we want to yet with an anti-human trafficking organization uh, for TF. So there are a lot of things that we are synced up into that gives the money that we make a purpose. And there's always another level too, because the the first thing is like, man, what's the math for me to be able to feed 70 or 700 or 7,000 or 700,000? You can just go up, 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 up. But there's also, you know, people want to scale up, but they don't want to scale down. And so the, another level of that would be like, you know, how, how much money do I need to make to feed 70 kids? That's a great question. Here's a better question. This is a level deeper. How much money do I need to make to purchase assets that can feed 70 kids when I'm no longer around? You know, they're just going to spin off cash flows that do not require me and do not require my family. How do I build structures inside of my community so that other people are feeding 70 kids, 700 kids when I bounce or when I die or when I move on? And really this idea of building legacy, because there's this piece of like, what can I do now? And then there's this piece of like, what can I do that's going to fix the roots of this later? And that's why at some point I'll probably go into politics partially because i can't stand stupid people and most I can, of them, i can see that i i literally yeah i've heard a lot of people say that but i can honestly see that keep the hair the same too i'll keep the hair the same but look dude like we if you want to keep somebody if you want to keep a generation of people poor and suppressed uh give them money but do not fix the education systems that teach them this is what we're missing you know, in the United States of America, I'm sure other countries have their own struggles, but this is what we're missing here is we want to be able to just give money to people and call it good. But unless that, unless they get the, the requisite knowledge so that they can teach their kids how to produce for themselves and those kids can teach their kids, we'll just end up repeating the same cycle over and over. And what I see a lot of times is there is an edge to giving because sometimes giving money for a person like me, easy, bro. Easy. You have a hundred thousand dollars and not feel it. Who cares? It's not a flex. It's just the fact of the matter. Who cares? But sometimes giving can just satisfy a moral, you know, a, a moral like aggravation, like, oh, I've done my part. But at some point, entrepreneurs have to get involved in the game of like, man, let's fix this shit that is creating and perpetuating the issue. You know, the schools aren't funded properly. You know, the, the zip codes are cordoned off the wrong way. And that's why it's like, I understand that people don't want to tackle the real issues, but that's why probably at some point when I'm bored with the businesses and whatever, there's nothing else to do, I probably will go into that to an extent so that my daughter and her family don't find themselves in the same position where it's like they're just giving to the same problem 
giving, 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 but it's a cyclical perpetuated issue that comes from our education. Oh God. I mean, you and I talk in conversation, like the rabbit hole will never end. I could, I could go a couple different directions off that, but I want to ask you what practices do you do in your personal life and your spiritual life and your physical life? Do you attribute to your success? And I know we've talked, you know, we talked about this early on in this conversation. I know that, you know, my spiritual practices, the fact that, you know, I go to, I go work out, I drink a lot of water, like all the things that I do, I have a gratitude list. I'm in communication with my spiritual advisor, like all the things that I do attribute to my success, whatever your definition of success is, like mine is creating financial freedom so I can spend more time with my son, right? That just, it just, I don't think it's ever going to end the financial freedom aspect of it but I'm creating more time for my son. And I think that'll grow too, right? Like that'll grow as you, as you talked about, it's easy for an entrepreneur or a heart centered hustler to forget the practices or the disciplines that they were engaged in that got them to a level. And it's very, very easy to lose that momentum and lose yourself is what I've found. So what practices or disciplines do you have in place that you attribute to where you're at right now? Obviously, probably very similar to you in that like quiet space, time for thinking, time for learning. My habits have changed over the years. When I first started, I was very rigid. Now I was like, you got to get up early and you have to have the same routine every single day for 300 days a year. And I was very rigid and intense. Now that, that produced for a while. It was effective for a while because it forced me to get stuff done. But as things have grown and as you know you speak about your son and and me having a daughter that changes things and it changes sometimes it it changes like literally when you're able to go to bed and how much sleep you get and so i've had to learn to have a little bit of flexibility in my routines and it's bumped me up to the second level and the first level is kind of ground level you know you do the same things every day you wake up at the same time every day but then the second level is really directional and it's like what's the what's the direction and, and can i build habits that are serving me directionally. So it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that I wake up at the same time every single day, but it means that whether I wake up at seven or whether I wake up, up at 530, I'm going to participate in the same type of activities every single day. So I, I definitely have a gratitude list. I journal every day. My journaling is freestyle and I just write and I do, I just, whatever I'm thinking, whatever I'm feeling, I get that out. I think self-awareness is one of the most powerful tools in anybody's arsenal. Too many people have no idea how they feel about things. They don't know how they feel about themselves. They don't know what direction they're heading in. They don't know what their goals are. They don't know what their targets are. They don't know how much progress they've made in the last year. And it's a problem. It's a mistake because if you can't track directionally, then you don't you don't have a scoreboard. So from journaling every single day, I use an app called Day One. And I can just go back, man, to 2016. And I can see where I came from. You talk about being down to earth. Like, this is why, dude. Because this morning, I was looking at 2018. We had a really bad March in 2018. I was looking through it for whatever reason. And we had 10 days where we had one sale in 10 days. And that'll make you grateful when you look back at a season like that, where you think like you're just running out of money. And so I'm able to go and really fully synthesize my direction, how I have grown, what, what lessons have I learned, and there's something about that that keeps you hungry and keeps you grateful at the same time. Those are the counterbalances there. Too much, too much contentment reduces your drive. You know, too much drive, though, can sometimes cannibalize gratitude. And so it's a tension between the both. Where, where am I unhappy with my current life? That's going to give me drive. And where am I grateful for the progress that I've made? That's going to give you that peace and that gratitude. So you just, I stay tensioned in the middle of those two places and it, it keeps me on pace. Oh, mic drop. Don't drop your mic because then we'll have to pause the episode and yeah, do yeah, some editing. Yeah, yeah. But Taylor, let me ask you this. And I wasn't going to do this, but I want to do this to give. There's a lot of sharks in the marketing industry, if you will. I myself, when I first got started, uh, I got taken for about 50 grand for a, a webinar build. The, the dudes who built the webinar out and worked with me on scripting it, I had no experience. I, they did not, never sent the automations out. They wanted more money from me. And I, I learned a great lesson from that. That's when I started to learn 
You know, that's yeah. when I started to study some of the same people that I'm sure we've both, you know, studied. Can you give an overview and really simplify what a funnel is for somebody who's out there listening? Uh, yeah. I mean, my definition of it is it's just a process where you have a lot of people educated and siphoned into the end where you have only a few people and those few people tend to be decision makers. And the people that'll buy that some of the like great. I thought that was going to be a long answer. That was the shortest answer in the history yeah. of podcasting, it's but just, the most uh, simplified and dialed in answer. Yeah. So I, I, this is a personal question. How often do you experience haters either online at events? I mean, you're out there shaking hands and kissing babies, right? Like, so you're at the, the events and you, you know, I know you do a lot of speaking and you're, and you're also trying to ramp that up and, and do more speaking in. I'm just going to throw it out there for, from a speaker, I co-sign it. Like, get out there, man. You're, you're a smart, you're a smart mind. Like you really are. So how have you, how have you dealt with hate? Whether it's just, and obviously you're not looking at the trolls that are Facebook messaging you at this point, but like, you know, more direct, direct experience with uh, individuals that disliked you or disliked the moves that you made. And obviously, you know, I know, I know how you're, rolling in, in the direction that you're headed and you're stepping on toes. And I think it's excellent. I like, I really enjoy watching it. How, how have you dealt with it and have, or I get, let me ask you, have you experienced it? And if you have, how have you dealt with it? I don't want to make an assumption that you have. No. Yeah. I've definitely experienced it. I think you, you just graduate and you grow and you learn how to deal with people that are not as educated as you, or they haven't thought about something as long as you have, or they're just a hater, man. And they just don't like their lives. You know, <laughs> most people, most people, you're, I'm glad you made the distinction because I feel like most people don't really have haters. They have trolls. And that's different. It's just a troll is just someone who doesn't like their life and they like picking on everyone else because it makes them feel better about their life. I don't have any process for that. I just ignore them because they hate their life. And there's nothing you can do that's going to be more punishing to them than the punishment they already have, which is they are a failure. That's worse than anything you could say to them. Notice the perspective there because we can circle back to it in a minute. That's half the battle is the perspective. But I've dealt with, you know, for me, the, the most difficult people that I've had to deal with in terms of haters, real haters, are, you know, past clients who I helped. They, they were, they were nothing, they had nothing, they were desperate, and we helped them. And then they started, you know, competing with us and making fun of us, you know, online, or friends that I grew up with, who thought that I was out of line for things that I've said. Uh, it's typically the people that you feel you are closer to that hurt you more than just trolls on the internet. And for me, it's like a lot of times there's something to learn even from a hater. Most of the times there is. Nobody wants to to deal with this. But if if you've got somebody who is like, you know, a friend who is like challenging me on something, I want to find what I can learn from that. Even if I disagree with them completely. Yeah, you know, I think that they're being dumb. And you know, there's a client that is stealing clients from us and writing bad reviews about us on the internet, you know, whatever, what can I learn from this that is going to make me, you know, a better thinker, a better producer, uh, a better leader, or, or sometimes you just, you learn because you see someone else mistreat you and you learn not to do that to someone else. There's a life lesson in everything. And a lot of times we, we view things as problems and it's really just tuition. You're, just, you're paying, you're paying a little bit of emotional currency right now to strengthen your perspective of the world and yourself. You're never going to avoid it though, because human tribalism and evolutionist psychology, like there's just a certain segment of the people who will be jealous of you, who will tell themselves this weird story about you. And this, the solution for me is like, most of the times I just, I feel sorry for them. You know, I pity them. You know, a producer doesn't have time to do this. And so they're obviously lacking opportunity. They're obviously, they, they obviously did not get what they needed when they were a child. And they obviously uh, are struggling somewhere with the purpose or identity crisis. There's obviously something wrong with them or they would not be acting this way. So the proper response for me is a little bit of pity because if I pity someone, I can be angry at them and uh, pardon the analogy, but I'm just going to go there because you seem like an honest person and you already congratulated me for stepping on toes. So let me step on some more. You have a child with autism. If a child who is mentally challenged, uh, you can't be mad at that child. That is that is evil to be mad at them for something that they're just challenged. The real response there is if you can help them, help them. 
and a lot of the haters that I've experienced in my life, there is a mental retardation that is preventing them from actually dealing with the shit from their childhood. It's preventing them from dealing with the, you know, not feeling like they belong, not having a father figure, not having a mother, not having friends, whatever. And my response to them should not be anger, should not be go out and defend myself. Most of the time, my response to them should be like, I feel bad for them. And I kind of pity them because what's going on in their life to make them respond this way. And if you can get to that place, a lot of times, you know, you'll be able to respond with kindness and everybody else would respond with vengeance. You can respond with kindness or you can not respond at all. And sometimes silence is the most powerful weapon in your arsenal. And there's people that right now, literally right now, somebody just sent me this Facebook thread and it's actually a, a, a post by a friend. And, but there's like some old people that I guess used to be in one of our programs back in the day and they're kind of hating on it. You know, if I respond to that, I make it important. And so sometimes the lack of response is actually the appropriate response to that threat level. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense to me. It's And it's not like when they're in that mindset, it's not like you're going to convince them otherwise. And it's and to me, you know, my experience is it's it's a waste of energy to engage because it's just, I'm just going to get amped up and drain yep. energy and it's going to amp them up and they're going to get what they actually wanted, which is an opportunity to get some clout or whatever you want to call it. So you, yeah. you allude, you alluded to something in that answer that I want to ask you. And that is how often has your work been jacked? Like how have you experienced that you alluded to it, but have you like had somebody like almost verbatim take the work that you've created and call it their own thousand times? Yeah. And then I've had people take our work and then accuse us of taking their work and they had it first. <laughs> it's like people are getting smarter. But yeah, a thousand times. It's just going to happen. Uh, it's never going to change. We're never going to be able to fully protect any of that. You know, there's a big, big, big internet marketer name. Big. People recognize him as maybe one of the biggest there is. Who copied pieces of our webinar almost verbatim and ran it. It's not going to change. It's just... It's kind of how things work. It's human nature. And what we've tried to do in response to that is we're just going to innovate so fast that it's like, you're going to literally have a full-time job just keeping up with us. And that works pretty well. I mean, that's, that keeps you pretty productive and it keeps you focused on the right things. I was going to, I was going to ask you, but I won't, I don't happen to have any of this person's work on my bookshelf. This has been, I mean, dude, I could stay on with you all day and I don't say this lightly. Like I've interviewed a lot, a lot of people and dude, you're one of the sharpest minds I've been on a call with. I feel like there's a million different directions that I could go with you, but I want to provide you with an opportunity to share what it is um, that you believe has been left out of this interview. I know that um, you have either one or two gifts that you want to offer the audience if they want to learn more about your work. So I want to also provide you an opportunity to share that. I just wanted to acknowledge you, man. Like you're an epic human doing doing amazing work, and and at first. I was like, I don't know if I want to interview this guy. I'll be straight. I'm like, I, I think he's just all about money. And then I started talking to, to your executive assistant and she jumped on a Zoom call with me and I was like, wow. She started, she started sharing with me who you actually are. And I was like, oh, wow. That is yeah. because you see people online and then you envy, right? So I view you and the success that you've had. And there's a certain, if I'm going to be a thousand percent authentic, there's a certain piece of me that's like, he's the enemy, right? Like he's got it and I don't. And then I go internal, but that's not how I get to that level, you know, harboring right. that. And so when I experienced that, I'm so grateful that I did this. I had this conversation with you. What do you want to share with the audience that maybe got left out? Bro, I don't, whatever you feel like people need. I think, uh, I think you're a great interviewer. So I don't have, I love the question, but I think sometimes, for me, like I just want to be an open book. You know, even speaking of money, I think I have a realistic shot at potentially one day holding a billion dollar net worth. I've never never shared that with anybody before. But I can see how things are going and I feel like I want to be an open book the whole way. But like one of the tenets that I'm holding to is like there's a there's a Taylor Welch, a 2014 version of Taylor Welch, who 
is probably looking for the way to think and the way to do and the way to behave. And I want to serve that person. And the only way to do that is not by having, you know, the best marketing messages and not having this perfect presentation and the perfect webinar and all that, that stuff. It's, it's by being authentic, being an open book and like sharing really how it happens. We don't have a perfect story. We made a lot of mistakes. And if you want to grow something quickly, you're going to have to sign up for a bit of a mess. Speed brings messes. You can't get around it. Everybody wants to grow something, scale it fast, scale it well, and you know, do it in a way that is, you know, all the problems are pre-solved and it's just not possible. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to do the wrong thing. You're going to have a thousand times when you send something and you wish you wouldn't have sent it. Or you say something and you wish you wouldn't have said it. It's not the end of the road. It's just an opportunity and a lesson for you to tune and optimize your operating system so that when you do get to the place of influence and you get to the place of platform and you get to the place of cloud and people are really taking you seriously and they're paying attention, my goal is that as my influence grows and my platform grows, I can remain worthy of that influence. That I don't have weird emotions that are driving responses. And I don't have ego wrapped up in what I say at the end of the day, the only way I'm going to be able to do that is owning up to the things that I do wrong, owning up to my mistakes and re- remaining authentic. It's not really a lesson or it's not really, you know, I don't know if it's the proper answer to what you just asked, but that's, that's truth. And it's kind of what I was feeling in the moment. So that's my answer to that. I think it's, I think it's beyond uh, the proper answer. A lot of people have asked me how I create content that converts to sales. And I tell them, over and over again, it's it. You need to be authentic. The only way, the only way to shift uh, what's going on is to be authentic. Like right, and and people, there's a lot of shit copy out there. There really is, or not not. I didn't mean copy. There's a lot of shit content out there, which yes, is also translates to copy because people are not being authentic. Yeah. One of my mentors says your business is broken, and if things go well, it always will be. And it just that. That quote really, really gets me to reflect on the fact that entrepreneurship is a journey, not a destination. And I'm just so pumped that I get to be on it because I, I'm having a blast and I'm getting my teeth kicked in and I love it. And, you know, I have wins, I yeah. have losses. I, I really love the losses. Taylor, uh, where can my audience learn more about you and traffic and funnels? I know that you um, had a gift that you were going to drop. It's going to be in the show notes um, as well as in the social media posts that maybe you're watching a clip of right now. If not, it'll be in the show notes at heartcenteredhustlers.com. The team has put together, we've been doing this for about 60 days. Um, It's just a collection of material that's actually free. Uh, trafficandfunnels.com slash stimulus. Don't know how to spell stimulus, but somebody can figure it out and throw it in. We'll, the, we'll uh, autocorrect it and put it in the you show know, notes. There's also, you know, you mentioned the journey. The, the Do you listen to Daily Mind Medicine? No. All right. Go Later, go to dailymindmedicine.com or search in your podcast for Daily Mind Medicine. This is a daily Monday through Friday, three to five minute podcast episode with me. And I talk about mental models and mindset, how to think, how to be articulate, how to handle resistance, all of the things that we talked about today. But you shared something that I just want to leave on. This would be my, the final act of the show is Coach John Wooden, one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, coached the UCLA and the eight championships, maybe, maybe nine. I was reading a book about John Wooden and somebody asked him one time, he's, you know, when he was old and retired, do you miss the games? Do you miss the trophies? You miss the excitement. You miss the locker rooms and the speeches and the, you know, just the slipstream of being in a winning season. And he thought about it for a minute and he, he looked at the person and he said, the thing I miss most are the practices. I miss the practices. I wish I could go back and relive the practices because traveling oftentimes is more enjoyable you know, than the destination. And the practices were the infrastructure. And John Wooden be- believed that, you know, when you, when you get the little things right, the big things tend to just fall into place. And so you mentioned the journey and it was actually the Mind Medicine episode from today of like, you know, some of, we all get caught up in the destination. We all want the result. We want the outcome. Go, 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 go. But if you've ever been on a, on a vacation with your son or with your family, it's like, man, some of the best moments are the journey too. There's going to come a day at some point when your son is old. And there are going to hopefully be moments that you can look back on. You're like, man, I'm glad that I was disconnected for this moment with my son. That's not a destination. 
That's part of the journey in between. If people can learn to love and enjoy the in between, because that's where most of your life is, then all of the big destination outcomes, they don't matter. There's checkpoints. The in between is where the richness is. It's where the vibes are at. It's where everything that you're going to really think back on one day. It's going to be Saturday morning at 730 with your son. It's not going to be, you're not going to be like, thank God for that big revenue month in 2020. I'm so glad that that is, who cares? You know, the infrastructure is the practices. And so that's a great mindset as, uh, or it's a great asset as well. Daily mind medicine. It'll just keep you sharp. It'll keep you grateful. It'll keep you pushing. And we got a lot of people who are, who are getting onto the bandwagon and the reviews are pretty good. So I'll give that to you guys as well. Man, thank you so much for, for taking the time to jump on. And uh, I'm just, I'm really, really excited to watch your journey and to also have, you know, somebody blazing the path for, you know, me and my team and in my, uh, my squad, if you will. So final question, what can I or the Heart Centered Hustlers community do for you to move your life and your work forward? Tell people about Daily Mind Medicine, tell people about what we're doing. It, we, I don't make any money off of Daily Mind Medicine. So that's something that I have put time into because I just want to help people out who are maybe like I was a couple of years ago. So that's it, dude. Share the word, share the message. I'm not going to profit off of you except through impact. Yeah, you may at some point because the man is so, the man and his team are so authentic that you may actually grab something that they've created. And I have, you know, one of my partners grabbed one of their products yesterday and was like calling, he called me in the morning after doing a couple of hours of a course that he got. And he was like, dude, this is, I can't believe they charge $47 for this. This is like, Epic. I'm like, great. Well, go finish it so that you can actually say that you completed the thing that you spent $47 on. There you go. Taylor, Taylor thank you so much, man. I look forward to uh, continuing to watch your journey and also uh, make some connections of some people that I believe um, would be mut mutually beneficial for you to know. So thank you so much for your time, brother. Thank you, man. Everyone knows that the greatest two investments you can make as an entrepreneur are one, hiring a consultant to guide and push you, and two, hiring the right marketing company to scale your business. Want to learn more about hiring my brain to work inside your business or my marketing company to scale your business? I invite you to visit www.markcrandall.net to get access to the resources I've created to allow you to stop working for your business and get your business working for you. Until next time, more revenue, less hustle.